Welcome, everyone. It's truly my pleasure to uh, present the Anna Fellowship Education Series tonight on treating the female athlete. Uh, these are just a few important reminders. Please mute your computer audio, turn off your video. Uh, this webinar will re be recorded. Please, please, please send us questions. Um, you can either use the chat graphic at the bottom of your screen uh, and send questions directly to Dr. Cassandra Lee or in the Q&A on the bottom of your screen as well. So it's really my pleasure to introduce our faculty tonight. I'm Elizabeth Matskin. I am the Chief of Women's Sports Medicine at Mass General Brigham. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School and I'm truly passionate about our topic tonight. We have an amazing uh, group of speakers. Our first speaker will be Dr. Mary Lloyd Ireland. She is um, truly a legend when it comes to this topic. So we're very lucky to have her with us tonight. She's a professor at the University of Kentucky and she's going to speak to us on sex differences in athletes. Our second speaker tonight will be Dr. Marcy Faustin. She is an assistant clinical professor at UC Davis. She is uh, trained in family medicine with a fellowship in sports medicine. She serves as our head team physician for USA Gymnastics, and she's going to speak with us on the female athlete triad and relative energy deficiency in sport. And last but not least, certainly not least, uh, Dr. Melissa Cristino, who I have the privilege of working with here in Boston, is an assistant professor also at Harvard. She works out of Boston Children's Hospital. She's the director of sports and mental skills research there, and she's going to share a lot of tips and pearls with us on the psychological considerations in the female athlete. This is our agenda for the night, and um, we're gonna have a lot of really important things to talk about. So without further ado, we'll get started with Dr. Ireland. It is uh, truly a pleasure to be uh, on this panel, and I'm going to talk about sex differences in athletes, incidence, diagnosis, and treatment, and my talk will be more directed at orthopedic differences, and I will speak at the end a little bit about advocacy. So clarify definition. Sex is the genetic and biologic property, and gender, as we know from our EMR advances, refers to socially constructed roles, behaviors, and attributes that society considers appropriate for men and women. So these are truly sex differences. Out of Boston Children's, pediatric uh, athlete Stracanelli and uh, uh, Stracolini uh, has this study. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, tells us uh, what we need to look for in female athletes, a higher rate of overuse injury versus traumatic injury, lower extremity and spine injury in females. What about sex differences in knees, patellofemoral pain greater by three times in the female athlete, OCD greater in males, and fractures greater in males. 33 years ago, I was involved with the USA Olympic basketball teams, men and women. This was before the dream teams, and we noticed a very high rate of knee injuries in these elite athletes. That's Cheryl Miller in the lower right, who is Reggie Miller's um, uh, sister, and she had bilateral ACL injuries. So we did some papers on this and, and thought about what we can do to improve uh, or to uh, uh, reduce these injuries. But uh, over the course of that uh, generation, 33 years, we still see significant differences, differences in basketball, team handball, netball, alpine skiing, soccer by two to eight times. So we're making some strides with some of the prevention, but ACL tears are here to stay. And how do we teach our athletes to land in a safe position? That's the prevention side, but it's about the same way when we have them return to play. And when they're ready to return to play, they also have to reestablish these landing patterns because they're going back to the same sport. So there's the position of safety, which is more hips, knees bent and soft landings in a position of no return. So this position of no return isn't really valgus, it's more of a functional pivot shift. So it's this valgus collapse, valgus, rotation, out of control movement. And it takes 70 milliseconds to tear your ACL. This UConn athlete tore her ACL, I believe, three times. So she's kind of 
out of her cone of stability, so to speak. You can see how her leg is outside of, of her hips. So that's that position of no return. The cone of silence. I am deeply concerned about the conference room. But I don't know if anybody remembers Get Smart, but the cone of silence is what we need to teach our athletes to land in that position where their feet are under their body. So this is the observation of this. Females and males are certainly different in lumbar lordosis, hip antiversion, and so this kind of places that knee in that position of no return, a valgus position to start off with, and then there's this knee collapse, so to speak. We've developed some things that are screening tools. How many step downs can you do in a control? When we look at these step downs on an eight inch wooden box, ACL side, 32, normal side and ACL injured, 36, and normal control, 40. So we should have some screening things that we can do to find out that at risk athlete. Certainly in the moon and the Mars studies, they have, uh, have definitely said sex differences. Male sex is associated with increased risk of revision and female sex is associated with increased incidence of contralateral injury. This was from the Kaiser Registry in California and the Swedish National Registry, female sex and contralateral injury, greater incidence of uh, uh, ACL injuries in females. We recently did a review article, 24 articles were reviewed and the, the thing, the take home message from this is that we need to tell our female athletes what they need to expect and they may not want to return to that sport. That's our goal as orthopedic surgeons. However, when we look at our sex comparison in this, contralateral injury, males 9%, females 22%. Total secondary injuries, these are more surgeries, 18% in males and 33% in females. So if we know that young females are at higher risk for injury and exposure to re-injury, what do we as surgeons do? I think we do have to be upfront with the athletes and their families, uh, risk of re-injury. So we must be the patient advocate in this situation, particularly the first time they've had, they've had an ACL injury. Can we establish normality? We can establish stability, but perhaps not normality is this mosaic. Osteoarthritis, unfortunately, is still very common. I think it's less than 50%, but some reports are 50%. After ACL reconstructions, we're doing a better job at it, but we still have concerns long-term. And it's difficult in our country to follow these young ladies young, uh, long-term. Mental differences, I'll defer that to our later speaker, but uh, there are differences uh, of, uh, after injury in females. And also there's the uniqueness of the sport in cheerleading and gymnastics. What about the hip? Uh, female athletes have higher incidence of femoral antiversion and acetabular dysplasia and ligamentous laxity, and the males have a different uh, presentation. Arthroscopic hip surgery has certainly caught on. I think you need to do a certain number of hip arthroscopies before you should be doing it in private practice if you're a general sports medicine doc. Female athletes have more pincer and instability. The types of female sports are different too, more flexibility, endurance, the males are more cutting contact and asymmetry of their hips. We've had a patellar protection program, maybe we need a hip protection program. Uh, and as Dr. Houston, one of my mentors uh, would say with patellofemoral problems, we saw a lot of failed ones when I was doing my fellowship at the Houston Clinic, you must know who to and uh, operate on, but more importantly, who not to operate on. There's nothing worse that cannot be made worse with surgery. What about shoulder instabilities? Males are more likely to go to the ER. I did not perform this surgery, as you can see in this MDI patient, the keloid. So uh, we don't have a good answer for the female with multidirectional instability. I think we still need to uh, um, learn from our mistakes, unfortunately. The moon shoulder group has um, come up with intraoperative findings in shoulder instability in young people, males, higher rate of labral tears and bone loss. The females have a higher rate of capsular laxity and we still don't have a great way of addressing that capsular laxity, which can be multi-directional as opposed to a single direction. Uh, this is a cheerleader with multi-directional voluntary uh, instability. So when you see this, I ask patients what, they're, what bothers them about their shoulder. And so when they can do this and you can see she's smiling, this is her bilateral shoulder instability. She can do, do, still do cheerleading, but I would not want her to be the base and cause problems for those above her. 
What have we done in surgical procedures? I've been through it all. We've fried, we've tied, we've capsulorified, and I think we need to continue to look for good ways for uh, stabilization of uh, the female athlete for multidirectional instability. And we don't have it yet. If there's something like a labral tear off the glenoid, that's kind of easy, but perhaps non-operative treatment is more appropriate. Females have more concussions than males, two times greater incidence of concussion in soccer and basketball. Um, in concussions, we have doubled the number and sports include basketball, soccer, volleyball, and lacrosse. And they're more severe concussions. Maybe it's because the males don't report. Now I wanna talk a little bit about physician advocacy. What does this mean? Advocacy is more than giving to our uh, AAOS PACs or giving to ANA. It is an action by definition by a physician to promote those social, economic, educational, and political changes that ameliorate the suffering and threats to human health and well being that he or she identifies through his or her personal work and expertise. And I'm going to go through some of these slides relatively quickly. They'll be in your deck. But what is this? This is who we are. We're advocates, we're a champion, supporter, backer, promoter, proponent, protector, patron, and a booster. And the adjectives uh, of an advocate is a verb or, or similar. So what do we need to do to protect ourselves and our young athletes? We need to take these tests. We need to be safe. Our residents and fellows need to take this safe sport for coaches, the, the test. NATA is coming out with another advocacy test for those of us who are blessed to take care of young athletes. U.S. US Center for Safe Sport, uh, I would visit this website. This is another United Educators website that we need to uh, take these tests and recognize these potential problems with our young athletes. Congress passed in um, 2018 a bill to prevent the sexual abuse of minors and amateur athletes by requiring, by requiring the prompt reporting of sexual abuse to law enforcement authorities and for other purposes. We need to know who it is we need to be addressing and take care of this at the grassroots at our level, if we're taking care of them because these young athletes trust us. So when we look at this uh, picture of Larry Nasser, which sickens me, I took care of some of those athletes. Did I miss something? Did I not, uh, was I not aware that something was going on? They never spoke out. And now uh, the, also males are not immune. Uh, Richard Strauss and Robert Anderson abused males. And by the time they figured that out, they were dead. So when we look at nobody knew, nobody reported really. So this uh, testimony by the gymnasts um, uh, on uh, the Hill, uh, and now the FBI is investigating and they were wronged. And there are a lot of women that have been wrong. So we, as those who tr are tr entrusted to the care of these athletes need to speak up and confront and take care of any potential abuse. These are some other links that I would like for you to look at our forum, which is female um, orthopedic surgeons. Uh, uh, we came up with some of these that should be uh, uh, hung in every training room, and I'll leave that for you to look at at a later time. Confront, report, don't walk away. Pay attention to any warning signs, whether it's uh, sexual abuse or, or abuse where we're talking about um, uh, eating disorders, red S, which is, which is in females and males, as we'll hear. And then this is a quote from William Osler, the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade, a calling, not a business. We often, the best part of your work will have nothing to do with potions and powders or surgery, but with the exercise of influence of the strong and the weak, of the righteous upon the wicked, of the wise upon the foolish. We are in a, a very blessed situation to be taking care of these athletes and we need to protect them and do the best we can with our orthopedic surgery procedures and keeping up. Thank you very much. Learn how to land at a good age. Thank you, Dr. Ireland. That was um, an excellent overview of uh, some of the sex differences in the female athlete. And then certainly um, important for us all to have a great awareness of how we can advocate not only for our female athletes, but um, our male athletes as well, and especially our younger athletes. So thank you for sharing that. All right, next up, Dr. Faustin. Hey, are you guys able to hear me? Perfect. 
Okay, so thank you to the organization for having me here today to speak to all of you. It's definitely a privilege to be amongst these amazing women. And so my talk today is the female athlete triad and relative energy deficiency at sport. Just like Dr. Lloyd Ireland already said earlier, it's seeing us, even if we're not seeing it. So I have no disclosures. So our objectives today are to describe the female athlete triad, also known as triad, and relative energy deficiency in sports, red S, understand how the triad and red S can negatively impact health and performance, and then discuss the clinical evaluation and treatment. So let's start with the female athlete triad. So in 1997, this was the first American College of Sports Medicine statement regarding this um, this disease process. And it had three parts. It talked about disordered eating, amenorrhea, or the lack of menstrual cycle, and then osteoporosis. In 2014, De Salza et al. had written a consensus statement that was endorsed by the American College of Sports Medicine and the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And they talked about how this was a continuum. So here on the right, you can see that we our goal is to have optimal energy availability eumenorrhea or normal menstrual cycles, and then optimal bone health. And then if we move here to the left side with this red triangle, when we really hit the um, severe aspects of this disease process, we have low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, and then osteoporosis. And we know it's a continuum and you do not have to have all three processes to have this type of disorder. And then we also have the male athlete triad. And actually Dr. Nativ and Dr. Fredrickson actually just published a paper this summer regarding the male athlete triad, which is one of the first. And then also talked about the three parts here on the left, energy deficiency, impaired bone health, and then reproduction, reproductive suppression, which for males, an example would be a low testosterone. And then again, this figure on the right, it shows you this continuum that it lives on. So on the green, where everything's in optimal state, but as we move down to this red area, we can have severe energy deficiency, typically lower than the female athlete triad. We can have functional hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and then you can have osteoporosis with or without a bone stress injury. Now, the International Olympic Committee in 2014 had written a paper, and it was entitled The Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport, or Red S. And so what they sought to do was think about how is this process affecting all of the organ systems, which is also what the female athlete triad did in their 2014 paper. And so it looked at such things as your GI system, or your growth and development, or your metabolic system. And on the right side in this circle, you can see how is it affecting performance and it, does it increase your injury risk? Are we having depression with this? Are we having decreased concentration? And so we wanna know how is the entire body affected by this low energy availability? And the cornerstone of both of those things are low energy availability. And we'll focus more on the female athlete triad. And so let's start with this portion. So it's a simple equation your energy intake or what you're eating subtracted by your energy expenditure or how much exercise you're doing. And that's how much energy you have available. So low energy availability means either you're not taking in enough food or you're exercising at a level that's putting you at a negative energy availability. And so what happens when this occurs? Many different um, symptoms that you can see here on the left side, whether it's disordered eating thoughts or poor performance, irregular menstrual cycles or constant injuries. And what is happening is it's affecting your hypothalamic pituitary axis. And so the way I like to think about it is setting the thermometer. So for myself, I like to have it at 75 degrees in my house. My husband would do 68 degrees. But just like a thermometer works, if it gets too hot in the house, then the air conditioning is going to turn on to bring that temperature back to 75 degrees. But then if it gets too cold in the house, it will turn off. And that's how your HPA axis is working. But when you have low energy availability, it literally turns it off and that thermometer is no longer working. And it's a spectrum. It could be mild, which is most of what we see, which is often unintentional or just a lack of education. It could be moderate, whether it's intentional or you're having some body dysmorphia, or it can go to the severe aspect where you may be having DSM-5 diagnosed eating disorders. And how common are eating disorders in athletes? So prevalence is wide, and part of that might be reporting. But in the athletic populations, they found that it can be 1% to 62% in one paper. And then looking at these Norway elite athletes, it ranged from 4 to about 14%. 
And then who's at increased risk? Who are you guys seeing in the clinic? So we know it affects athletes more than non-athletes. It'll affect females more than males. And then those leanness sports, so such as gymnastics or figure skating, or those that are weight specific, such as wrestling versus those non-leanness sports. And when is the peak onset time of this? And it's typically during puberty or adolescent when they're having significant change in their body composition. And because this is near and dear to my heart, um, I just wanna throw in the slide regarding mental health effects of eating disorder. It always shocks me to read it again, but anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of all psychiatric disorders, including bipolar or schizophrenia. And so if we're seeing this or we have a suspicion, we have to intervene because of this mortality and morbidity risk. And there are other diseases that you guys can see when you take the slide deck. Now let's move on to low bone density or stress fractures, which are part of your specialty. As you guys know, we have most of our bone is built in those teenage years and it peaks about age 20 to 30 years old um, and are a little bit later than the females. But if we decrease our potential, as you can see with this dotted line, we cannot make up that bone loss later on in life. And this is why it's so important to really intervene early on when we see this, because there's a time that we may not get this back. And we know there are a lot of risk factors for this. And regarding stress factors, which you guys know well, when there's a repetitive load or there's an excessive breakdown or there's just not enough time to repair it, this can lead to injury, um, which causes these stress fractures. And what are these negative effects? So in the short term, we have the stress fractures or the traumatic fractures. You can't train and compete. And we know through COVID, those negative effects it can have on the mental health. Um, and you can have osteopenia or osteoporosis. Just last week, I have a runner athlete and her Z-score is negative 1.7, which is osteopenia. Osteoporosis would be at negative 2.0. And she's only 20 years old. And the long-term effects are osteoporosis later in life or increased risk of fractures such as hip, spine, pelvis, or possibly early mortality. Now let's move on to the menstrual dysfunction. Now I know you guys as orthopedists uh, may not be as comfortable or take care of this in your clinic, but as a family medicine physician, this is bread and butter for me. And so looking here on the right, you probably remember this picture and you don't need to know all the details, but I want you to remember that the menstrual cycle is a cyclic fluctuation of these hormones. And again, that's when it's working normally and it, that, uh, hip, um, that HPA axis has not turned down, okay? And so the menstrual cycle usually lasts about 28 days. Normal range is from 24 to 35 days. The first seven days is usually when you're having your menstrual bleeding. And that's in your follicular phase, where then your estrogen increases, which is important for bone health. Then you have your LH surge. And then we move into our luteal phase where your progesterone increases. Now, primary amenorrhea means you have not started your menstrual cycle by the age of 15 years old. Now, this is common, and we hear this all the time. Just because it is common does not mean it is normal. And this is our time to step in and really provide education. And a few more definitions, illegal amenorrhea. This is if you're having menstrual cycles that are longer than 35 days, or if you're having infrequent periods, having less than nine periods per day, per year. And so the way I ask this is usually in the last 12 months, how many menstrual cycles have you had? Because what typically can happen is that when they're in season and they're training really hard and they may not be eating as much for various reasons, they may lose their menstrual cycle. But if you're catching them in an off season, they'll say, oh, I'm having regular menstrual cycles. And so that's why you wanna know the last um, in the last 12 months. And then secondary amenorrhea is no period at all for three months. And we know about 50% of exercising women have some type of menstrual dysfunction. So again, this is our time to really come in and provide education. A plug for birth control and bone health. What we see a lot um, from various specialties is that patients will come in and they'll say, I haven't had my menstrual cycle. And so then they'll get put on birth control. But that is not the answer. Because like my co-head team physician for USA Gymnastics, Dr. Ellen Casey says, our periods can be our superpower. And they tell us if we're having enough energy and how healthy our body is functioning. And also these, the birth control pills can decrease our bone building potential in high school aged athletes. And that's been found before. So how do we apply this practically in the clinical setting? So there, here are the screening questionnaires. On the left side is for female athlete triad, and then on the right side is for male athlete triad. And for myself, I like to break it up into menstrual history, nutrition, and then bone health. Um, and you guys will have access to the slides. 
But for nutrition, I found that instead of asking, how's your diet, younger people think that then they're dieting, like they're restricting some type of food. So typically I say, how's your nutrition? How many meals are you eating a day? And that's how I try to open up those conversations and understanding people may not open up right away, but if you continue to ask these questions, they know that you're gonna be a trustworthy person and then they can be vulnerable with you. Clinical exam, we get all of our vitals and our BMI is very important. Um, and then we look at their appearance. Are they thin or frail? We do a heart, lungs, and abdomen exam. And then we look at their skin, lanugo, which is extra hair that can grow whenever you have anorexia, or Russell signs. We're looking at their MCP joints and are they having calluses there? And that could be a sign of somebody with bulimia who's been purging often. Then we do the diagnostic workup. In the 2014 consensus, consensus statement by DeSalza, they have this beautiful algorithm that we follow um, in regards to getting this lab work. And for you guys as orthopedists, you may want to start this lab work or um, you can refer them out. And that's where we know we need that interdisciplinary team. So whether we're talking to their primary care physician, their OBGYN and endocrinologist, primary care sports medicine physician. But then we also have to get everybody on board, whether they need a sports psychologist or a psychiatrist, a sports dietitian, a physical therapist, the coach and the parents. We want the team around that athlete to really be educated so we're all getting them as healthy as possible. And then what does the treatment look like? And so um, I like this graph here where it's not gonna be overnight that they're gonna feel better, but in the green setting, you can see that it can take days or weeks before they'll actually feel less fatigue and they'll have more energy. And then it can take up to months, sometimes years for their menstrual cycles to come back. But when their menstrual cycle comes back and regulates, we know they have reached a normal energy status. And then the recovery of their bone mineral density can take a little bit longer. And then here on the right side, um, there are risk factors that we're looking for. And this is a sample of what a return to play would look like. When do we feel they're safe to get back to sport or when they're not safe? And we need to continue to talk amongst the interdisciplinary team. And then prevention. So education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world is what Nelson Mandela said. And really a lot of this is unintentional. Usually maybe when they're going from high school to the college level and they're increasing their competition significantly, they may not know they need to increase what they're eating. And so making sure we're educating them. So in conclusion, the low energy availability is the cornerstone of both the female athlete triad and relative energy deficiency in sport. And there's three pillars of the triad, low energy availability, decreased bone mineral density and reproductive abnormalities. Our high risk populations are the females, athletes, and then weight specific or aesthetic sports. And then prevention, recognition, and treatment are crucial to the athlete's overall well being. And we have to do it as a team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faustin. That was an amazing talk. Um, you know, I think one of the real big take home messages when I listen to this is that as as physicians, we have to ask the questions. And, you know, as you pointed out, it's not just asking about their most recent menstrual cycle because you'll get a skewed answer. I also find that when I ask about their nutrition, you know, oh, I eat great. And if you probe a little more like, what do you eat? You know, do you eat three meals a day? You can get very different answers. So I think for all of us, we just need to be uh, comfortable asking the questions. And um, sometimes I'll even explain to them why I'm asking these questions, because especially when they come see the orthopedic surgeon, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm here for my hurt, you know, bone or knee or whatever it may be. And so when we veer off and ask about nutrition and menstrual cycle, they they look at us a little funny. But thank you for that um, uh, excellent talk. All right, Dr. Cristino, enlighten us, please. <laughs> All right. Can you guys see my slides? OK. Great. All right. Um, well, I think the talks have been awesome so far. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about this topic, which I think is really important. And again, something that um, comes to our office every day. Um, I have no financial disclosures. My one disclosure relevant to this talk is that I was a female athlete. Um, and I think that for anybody who was or is uh, currently an athlete, that's really a valuable skill set that you have in a way that you can relate to your patients. Um, it can be very helpful when you start going into your practice. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the psychological implications of injury in general, as well as some specifics for the female athlete, and then how that affects some of our surgical outcomes. 
Now, when we think about either athlete recovery from injury or just athletic performance in general, so many things go into that, right? So as orthopedic surgeons, we concentrate for the most part on physical health. We fix the knee, we fix the shoulder, but it's important to consider everything else that is playing a role in the background because that can influence what you are doing. All of the psychological constructs that you see here have been studied um, in regards to orthopedic surgery, in regards to sports medicine. We'll talk a little bit about some of these today, um, but this has been um, uh, infiltrating the literature, particularly in the last five years in orthopedic surgery. As we all know, injuries are just basically part of sports participation. I don't think families realize this, but uh, for us, uh, we know that this is part of the deal. Um, and emotional responses are normal to injuries. It's okay to be sad when you tear your ACL. The problem is though that injuries can really start to take a toll on an athlete's psyche um, and it can either precipitate or exacerbate serious mental health conditions such as depression and anxiety. So it's important to keep an eye out for our patients. Everybody deals with these things in different ways and responses might not be predictable. And there's clearly a difference between routine injuries with predictable outcomes and return to sport versus those that are more career ending. <laughs> Multiple studies have shown that injured athletes experience mood disturbances, psychological distress, post-traumatic stress disorder, and can suffer from athletic identity setbacks. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, um, athletic identity is the degree to which one identifies as an athlete. And it can be a really important part of someone's overall self-concept. So if you have a, a sports or life type of person and you take away their sport, they are pretty devastated and can really struggle with that. There are some issues that seem to uh, affect female athletes more so than our male athletes. Things like gender inequity, discrimination and abuse, uh, body image and disordered eating. There are some differences between males and females in sleep patterns. Females are more likely to experience depression and anxiety than male athletes. And anybody in a minoritized community also has additional stress surrounding their sport and treatment for injury. We heard about relative energy deficiency in sport, and one of the drivers for this can be disordered eating. Um, risk factors for this are pressure to optimize performance or modify uh, appearance, which is common in our aesthetic sports. Um, and, you know, disordered eating is really intimately involved with psychological factors and conditions like per perfectionism, depression, anxiety, OCD. Um, we know that our female athletes are at higher risk for developing eating disorders than the general population. So not only do we need to ask about their nutrition, but we need to think about um, the uh, psychological um, uh, associations that come along with that. Um, this is a review paper that we published over the summer that's available um, in the references that you guys will get, just sort of summarizing some of the key factors that help improve recovery and some factors that um, inhibit recovery. And there's a lot of barriers to seeking help as an athlete. So a lot of athletes think it's a sign of weakness to say something. They don't want to reveal their symptoms. They're also worked, accustomed to working through pain. Um, for many of our young athletes, they may have never had to deal with failure and they just literally don't know what to do with it. Um, they feel lost and paralyzed. And then another unfortunate reality is that mental health resources sometimes are hard to find, are not available, or they're not covered by insurance. And that's another hurdle that we have to overcome as a profession. Now, I wanna put this in context a little bit. Um, this is one of my patients that I met for her revision ACL reconstruction. She's a 20 year old college ski racer. And this is like my star patient here. So she was super motivated, super upbeat. And when I cleared her to return to sport, I asked her to write down what she felt like when she went through her recovery. And even I was surprised at what she wrote. So she said, receiving the diagnosis from my surgeon uh, was one of the worst moments I've experienced in my life. I thought I had done everything right. I thought it wouldn't happen to me. I wanted to fast forward through the next year so I didn't have to live through what I knew was the inevitable path. And so if this is my most well-adjusted patient saying these things, what is everybody else thinking? In terms of surgical outcomes, multiple studies have shown that psychological status does predict outcomes and return to sport rate in athletes. This is particularly true of ACL reconstruction, and I'll share some literature on that with you. And then psychological factors also um, influence outcomes indirectly because they've been shown to be associated with adherence to rehab, which then improves outcomes uh, over time. 
So for ACL surgery specifically, we know our return to sport rates are far from perfect. Our return to sport rates are higher in male athletes and younger patients. And fear of re-injury is the most commonly cited reason for not returning to sport. And this is despite the fact that most patients achieve normal knee function in most studies. This is one of the first papers looking at psychological readiness um, in returning to sport. And they actually showed that preoperative levels of psychological uh, readiness predicted who would return to sport at 12 months. So who a person is may very well determine how they do. And it's really important for us as surgeons to consider that. This was a study that looked at adolescent athletes at the time of diagnosis of an ACL tear. And you can see a really significant percentage of patients in the 80, 75, uh, 80 percentile range experienced symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. These emotional disturbances were higher in older adolescents as well as females when compared to males. Fear has also been studied quite a bit. Um, and in this study showed that high fear was associated with a higher secondary ACL re-injury rate. This study looked at 36 females after ACL reconstruction and used 3D motion capture. And they found that high fear was associated with a stiffened movement patterns that are typically associated with an increased risk for secondary ACL injury. A couple of recent study on psychological readiness as we've seen, readiness can influence return to sport and has been associated with that. Factors that um, are associated with psychological readiness are male sex, young age, higher IQDC scores, among some of those other things that you see there. There's another study just published this year showing that females reported lower psychological readiness at all time points in a prospective study um, when compared to males. And this is data that hasn't been published yet. It's in the works, but this is our, our Aurora study at Boston Children's where we're looking at psychological readiness and psychological distress prospectively. And we found that females report lower psychological readiness and higher stress than males at six months post ACL. Uh, this was another study that you guys will get in the references. It's a nice qualitative study that asked 25 high school patients about their recovery. And you can see some commonalities um, between male and female patients and what they went through and how they responded, but there's also some differences. And it's understanding those subtle differences where we may be able to make differences for different populations. And so if you get one thing out of uh, this talk, it's just what Dr. Maskin just mentioned, you need to ask the question because you'll be very surprised what people will say when you ask them very simple things. Um, these are some proposed screening questions. There's a bunch of formal psychological measures that you can use. Um, I also think it's really important that we try to demystify the stigma of mental health issues for our patients, encourage both physical and emotional recovery, know what our mental health resources are in our community so that we can then um, triage uh, our patients as needed to the right person. Um, working in multidisciplinary teams, I think is, is critical and extremely helpful. And then trying to keep your athlete engaged and involved as well. Um, the good news is, is that all of these psychological metrics can be adjusted and enhanced and can be trained and learned. And so with mental skills training, we have the opportunity to improve these things and hopefully improve outcomes. Um, so in conclusion, I, psychological factors, I do think, play critical roles in patient perceptions and their outcomes, ultimate return to sport. Um, it's important to ask our patients about the emotional side of their recovery. And then, of course, understanding unique patient populations gives us a better sense of how to adequately treat people to the best level that we can. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cristino. So as you, uh, we change up slides here, just... One quick question. So, you know, we talked about um, when we see these athletes and, you know, unfortunately we're often the bearers of, of unfortunate news. And when we have to tell perhaps a young female athlete that she just tore her ACL and, you know, the tears are welling up and the parents turn white and, you know, there's a little bit of a sense of shock, like any tips or advice on, on how to, you know, initially address that? Yeah, it's hard um, and it happens frequently. But I think, you know, just saying what is the truth, like this is a bummer, this is really hard and I'm sorry that it happened to you. Um, I also think a challenging, when, when somebody's very upset, I think that they don't hear much beyond that diagnosis. And so trying to normalize it, number one, saying, 
you're not the first kid on your team that's going to have this. We're going to get through it, trying to kind of get them on your team to get better. And then usually I actually, I usually see them back for a motion check anyway, if their knee is stiff. Um, I discuss the surgical details later because it's, it's too much, um, I think, in one visit. Great. Thank you. Dr. Lee, any questions or should we roll into some cases? Yeah, there was one question um, from the audience. It was with regards to how we would um, address uh, surgically uh, MDI in these patients. So what are, what are the indications for surgery? Uh, so for me, I mean, the, the indications for surgery are multiple, multiple failed attempts at physical therapy. Um, in a patient that I've spent some time getting to know, um, certainly, I, I wouldn't uh, recommend surgery in a habitual dislocator with MDI. Um, but, you know, these patients do have real problems. And so we do a capsulography. Um, we'll tighten them up. And um, I think the hard part is a lot of them also have some Ehlers-Danlos or sometimes some underlying conditions. And those need to be discussed because uh, they can do well and love their shoulder again for you know, five or so years or eight years or maybe 10, but they can often stretch out again and that, that risk needs to be discussed with them. I don't know if um, Dr. Christina or Dr. Ireland, do you have other thoughts? I think number one, you need to get to know them uh, and have them truly fail <clears throat> their, uh, their therapy and uh, know that they're trying. Uh, I probably will do a workup, uh, including uh, maybe an intraarticular GAD uh, to see if there's anything off the glenoid that I can book back to bone. That's always a better way to do it. Uh, I've lived through the um, fry it, do a thermal capsularophy, which we thought was going to be great because it's easy. You just kind of put a little wand on there and it burns the tissue and it's a very bad thing. So uh, when it's easy, that may not be the right thing to do. So I think I do like you, tux and capsularophy. But I must say I rarely operate on these because I see them sometime later after three and four surgeries. And I think we should go back to... Um, Carter Rose open <clears throat> capsularophy, and we don't seem like in uh, arthroscopy we think about doing that, but that's a very good operation. You get them tight enough, so think about doing an open bank heart or a capsularophy in an open way, and we don't get a lot of training on that, and I think that's something to explore. I agree with both of you. I, I do the exact same thing. And the only thing I would um, add to Dr. to Dr. Matskin's comment is that um, these patients often get put off as sort of crazy patients um, and they do have real problems. So you do need to listen to them and you know um, use your judgment and help to take care of them and not just push them off. I think that's really important. And it takes time to get to know patients and address the, the, whole, the whole spectrum because sometimes in these patients, they're they're very um, uh, competitive. They want to, you know, want to uh, please their peers and their parents and their coaches. And so you really have to try to talk to that young athlete and look them in the eye and see, uh, just know how important it is for them to compete. And uh, I, I think they get branded as some type of a psychologic um, issue. And maybe you counsel them to do another sport. Thank you. All right. So while we have a few minutes, I think we can um, maybe run through a few quick cases. Um, I would encourage anyone who's on the webinar live to feel free to jump into the chat or the Q&A with um, questions or, or um, engage in these case presentations. So um, this is a 17-year-old female, high-level ballerina. She had an awkward landing from a leap while performing and felt a pop in her knee. She does have a past medical history significant for anorexia, sees a therapist on and off, does not work with a nutritionist, uh, has a history of an osteochondral defect in the past. Uh, social history, the important aspect of that is she does have a twin sister who is also an elite ballerina. Uh, so these are her x-rays um, after her uh, injury, um, which don't show anything overly significant. Uh, this is her MRI. Um, anyone in the chat want to jump in and just type in what they what they see, what we're most concerned about? I think it's pretty pretty obvious. But um, we could see the ACL injury um, over here. 
So, um, Dr. Cristino, not to pick on you, but um, this is your case. And so you have a 17 year old elite ballerina with an ACL tear. Um, if we just talk about the, you know, orthopedic surgical aspects, um, graft choice for you. What are your, what are your thoughts? What went through your head when you um, saw this athlete? Yeah. So um, I think for me in the last couple of years, I've migrated uh, much more so towards using quad tendon than I do an all inside technique. Um, I think it's, um, uh, cosmetic, um, and pretty minimally invasive. And so, uh, that is what I, um, I recommended for her. I've gotten away from hamstrings. All right. So we have a few arthroscopic pictures here. You can see the torn ACL, nice PCL, um, and then, um, our femoral tunnel and then our beautiful quad tendon autographed, uh, that went in. So um, I think, you know, this case, really the question is, what are the important questions or struggles or things we need to recognize? Um, so, you know, first is, you know, talking to this patient about her menstrual cycle, um, which I assume was probably abnormal given her history um, and getting a patient like this plugged into endocrine. Uh, nutrition is going to be key. Certainly, if an athlete can connect with a sports nutritionist that really can understand um, what they're going through, it's going to be uh, beneficial. Uh, the psychological aspects in this case um, are probably to an extreme, given the history of anorexia um, and the social family pressures, especially of having a twin sister who's continuing to dance as an elite ballerina while uh, this patient is struggling through a rehab after an ACL, um, you know, and then getting these patients plugged into, you know, appropriate physical therapists who can, you know, do more sports specific training. Um, any other comments on this case? This is a pretty complex case, which demonstrates a lot of the things we talked about tonight. I think that the easiest part of this case was the surgery. Um, everything else has been, uh, a, it's been a struggle for her the whole time and trying to just pull her along. And, um, you know, the sister thing is not a small deal. Um, and so it's, it's been interesting because I have had many patients with um, issues that we've had to deal with, but this one really has like all of the things um, in one. So she's, she's doing well, but it's been tough. Did you have a family meeting with her sister involved too, or pre-op and not with the sister, um, but mom and her and I have talked quite a bit. And then she's plugged in with all of our um, female athlete programs. So she sees our, our psychiatrist and our nutritionist. So we have like a team around her, um, but that's not a bad idea. Uh, but now that she, she's about three months out now, so she's getting back to some like light bar work. And so um, she's turning a corner, I think now. The other thought is, but it sounds like she's in an interdisciplinary team, is um, the sports psychologists are great, but sometimes, especially when they have that extreme eating disorders, thinking about cognitive behavioral therapy and kind of dealing with whatever that, um, the etiology of that eating disorder has come through and then helping her deal with that to try to change that mindset. So it might be a consideration to even have both like a CBT therapist and a sports psychologist on board who can help with that. It's a great thought. All right, I'm going to roll through, I think, one more case here. So this is a 17-year-old female who um, was running four to nine miles every day for several months. Um, she presented with a one week of left hip pain. Um, she had taken one week off from her running. She had pain with just walking and weight bearing. Uh, her diet was fair with regards to nutrition after some deep questioning, um, and she's been amenorrheic for the past year. So these were her initial images. Um, didn't look overly concerning. I mean, certainly was worried about, you know, stress fracture in this type of case. And, um, and so, you know, I didn't see anything obvious, um, but I have a very low threshold to jump very quickly to an MRI in these patients. I think there was some concern of whether or not there was a little something going on when you blow that X-ray up. Um, but here's the MRI. Um, and interestingly, it showed a little bit here, but a little bit more stress fracture on that 
uh, medial side. And um, when she came back to see me after her MRI, she reported that she was already feeling significantly better um, after resting. Uh, but we talked extensively about um, treatment and our treatment plan was we made her non-weight bear with crutches. Uh, we talked a lot about symptomatic treatment. If it hurts, you have to back off. If it doesn't, then we'll slowly increase your activities. Uh, we had her plugged in with PT for some strengthening after she started doing better. Um, we referred her to get her plugged in with all of our multidisciplinary um, team to include nutrition, endocrine, and sports psychology. Um, and she continued to probably do more uh, than she should against our advice and came back with worsening hip pain. And we repeated second uh, radiographs. And if you look closely, you can see some differences here. So we repeated an MRI. And at this point, this 17 year old female runner has a uh, full stress fracture uh, from the uh, medial to lateral side, which unfortunately uh, then requires an open reduction internal fixation. So I think just the point of this case is really um, making sure that our patients understand the grave consequences of not following up with you know, this symptomatic treatment and how important it is if there are injuries that it's okay to push through some pain. Um, but any bone stress injury is not one of them. Um, does anyone have anything to add to that? I'd love to hear from our panel or, or our chat. Well, you know, on the compression side, we might do okay, but I would be like you. I'd pull the trigger very early to get an MRI scan, even though if not classic groin pain, but in somebody that's a runner and has any uh, eating disorder issues, um, you know, the tensile side of bone are the bad ones, the dreaded black line of Jones fracture or anterior tibia. And I had a patient um, who had a navicular stress fracture. I think these are kind of uh, missed too. And uh, she, when I asked her in my detailed history 20 years ago, do you have normal periods? And she said, yes, but that meant she had three a year when she wasn't playing basketball. So again, go back and maybe do a little better on your history taking. And uh, uh, MRs are great. Fire them when, when you're concerned about those high risk stress fractures on the tensile side. Thank you. All right, we have one more quick case I think we'll run through just to show one other aspect of, of what we've spent a lot of time talking about tonight. Dr. Boston, if you want to quickly present that. I think you're on mute. Rookie move this far into this pandemic. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so I have a 13 year old, healthy, fully vaccinated Asian male who is a cross country runner. He's a basketball player and a swimmer who presented to see me for intermittent right thigh pain for about four to five months. He said initially in the beginning, he used to get sharp pain at the end of runs. And that's what mom would say. But then he just felt like it was achy or tired. During that time, he had increased his running mileage from about 15 to 35 miles a week. Um, he had become a vegetarian during that time. And so our initial treatment was just to stop running for about four weeks or so. And so his pain had resolved. And then when he reintroduced his sports of running slowly with a running program and then basketball and swimming, then his pain had returned. And so his vitals were stable. His BMI was in the 11th percentile, which for kids, we get concerned if they're less than the 85th percentile um, for normal weight. And then in general, he was a thin male. He was accompanied by his mother and his musculoskeletal exam was pretty unremarkable. He had no tenderness over that right thigh, no pain with a fulcrum. And then his hip and knee and lumbar exam were all normal. And so here are his x-rays. We didn't see anything abnormal. And then um, Dr. Cassandra Lee actually helped me with this case. And what he had was about a 12 centimeter longitudinal stress fracture of his um, diaphysis of his femur. So you can see that here um, on this right side and that thickening um, and the bone marrow edema within this area. And then for these axial views, um, Dr. Lee taught me a lot actually about the bone cortex, but we can see the changes and the um, periosteal changes that were there. And so um, it was a pretty extensive um, stress fracture that we were looking at, and we had done a lit review, 
And there were not um, there is not much information regarding this, and so um, we just we decided to do non weight bearing for about four to six weeks um, until he becomes symptom free. The problem was initially we're not really trusting his symptoms because he was saying he didn't really have pain, and then he has this extensive injury, and so we put him on crutches, and we were going to allow him to start swimming at about three weeks, which I actually happened to see him yesterday, and he was doing well. I did do a lab workup and he had a low vitamin D level, which we are treating. And then we're waiting for his testosterone, which is a send out. And then before we even got the MRI, I had referred him to the dietitian, and we're encouraging him to either reintroduce meat or to um, increase protein in that manner. And he sees a dietitian on Friday. And then I also got a DEXA scan, which in the female athlete triad or male athlete triad, they have a good algorithm of when you do get a DEXA scan. He didn't necessarily fall within that border, but because of the extent of his injury, we want to take a look at his bone density. Anything to add, Dr. Lee? I think the only thing I would say is I would query the panel um, in terms of, I mean, I haven't, I hadn't seen a longitudinal stress fracture like this. I mean, it, the axles kind of, it was hard for me to take a look at it, but looking at the axles, you can see that kind of crack within the cortex. And then you can see that big periost or big cortical um, kind of reaction. And just, it's been there chronically, right? How thickened his cortex is. So I guess the question is, would anyone go aggressively and nail this or just, you know, try this conservatively and see if we can get this to heal? You know, I agree with what you guys are doing, especially in a 13 year old male. I think their potential for healing, if they're uh, compliant with treatment, would be would be excellent. Swimmers don't like to run. So what the heck was he doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think he kind of healed himself, maybe because he because he backed it down a little bit and maybe he had a more favorable stress fracture. But I would just say that these are difficult cases and for the fellows going into practice in an area where you may not have the support that UC Davis has or that Boston Children's have, don't be afraid to ask for help. And that multidisciplinary approach is not everywhere and it's hard to find and to really treat these athletes. And you got to treat them early on, particularly the Red S and the uh, female athlete triad. If you don't, then, then there is like uh, Dr. Foston said, a high mortality rate in these uh, young individuals. And it's on us as advocates, I think, to act and to act early and get intervention because uh, these kids want to compete and they're not going to tell you they're hurt. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think that was a great case to wrap up with. Um, so just a few things tonight. This um, uh, webinar will be viewable um, in 24 hours. Uh, and also um, everyone who's joined us, remember that um, Join Anna, it is free for our fellows and it provides tremendous benefits. So I would encourage any of you that are not currently a member, uh, please join us. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank our panel and uh, Anna for uh, giving us the opportunity to talk on something that uh, we find um, extremely important. Um, and as mentioned earlier in one of the talks that probably the most important thing we can do is educate and continue to talk about this topic. So thank you all.